this week, Weirdos 2. Last week was Weirdos 1, and now we got Weirdos 2. Uh, okay, uh, never mind that. That's, I haven't seen that slide in a good time. So today I decided to try to uh, give an introduction to what I'm going to talk about, because like I said, I'm going to hit three different kinds of weirdos, and there's not necessarily a smooth arc that goes through all of them. So in order for everybody to keep pace with what I'm discussing, I'm going to just introduce quickly. So I'm going to do a speedy 15 slide review on the mission. All of the slides you're going to see, for people who have been here, they'll have seen them all already, but I just want to remind people about where we think your mission comes from. And then I'm going to talk about something called giant radio closes. And then I'm going to talk about the awful truth, uh, which is uh, the weird behavior in the individual pulses of uh, pulsars, including uh, so things called nulling and drifting subpulses. And then at the end, very quickly, I'm going to talk about mode switching. And uh, this is something that's very, very hot at the moment. So it sort of covers the what's hot right now uh, aspect that I decided to delete from the series. OK, so a speedy 15 slide review of the mission. So I apologize for people who are seeing this for the first time. It doesn't make sense. I have four glasses of water here to help me. <laughs> OK. Um, so everybody remembers, we have at the surface of the neutron star, we have a strong uh, magnetic field emanating from one of the poles, the lines close to the, the um, polar, uh, to, to the magnetic uh, axis sort of come out parallel and then they converge. And this, uh, as, we, as we showed in previous weeks, if you can rotate a system like this around very fast, you can generate an incredibly strong electric field. And then particles that are created, particles that wander into this electric field uh, get accelerated, and electrons will get, in, in this configuration, I've got electrons getting accelerated this way. And as they, as they move and get accelerated, they radiate non-thermal radiation. What happens to this non-thermal radiation is that it can actually interact with the magnetic field itself and produce uh, an electron and a positron. <coughs> Everything in this interaction is conserved. The energy of this photon is converted into the energy of these two particles. And this is a negative charge, and this is a positive charge. So the resulting state has no charge, just as the, pre the, the, the initial state has no charge. However, if you create a, a, a positron in, in, in this field, it will want to uh, accelerate in the opposite direction. And so you get uh, current going, in, you get sort of electrons going up, positrons going down, and a configuration like this uh, will short out the electric field. But once it gets shorted out, the, the rotation builds it back up again, and the acceleration, <coughs> the accelerating voltage starts off again, and the same situation happens over and over again. And this leads to what I call a spasmodic oscillating current. And so a cartoon of, oh, OK, OK, I okay. know. Okay, so that leads to our spasmodic oscillating current, which is like a waves of current just uh, zipping out. And important factors to consider is that if you are a particle and you want to radiate non-thermal non radiation, you can do it incoherently, which is that if you have three particles moving out and they're not sort of tightly bunched together, they will just emit their three photons and that's the way it goes. However, if you manage to radiate coherently, that is, you get all the particles bunching together tightly, and they all radiate sort of as a group, then you end up with this amplification. It's, a, it's an n squared amplification. So rather than getting three photons, you get nine photons. And that's the thing why this is the wave of photons. And this is how the radio beam comes about. So uh, our radio beam is coming out in, these, in this spasmodic oscillating current. Along the pole, along the pole where the field lines are mostly aligned, then that's where the particles can stay coherent. If they live on the diverging field lines out here, the neighboring particles won't be able to be moving together at the same speed in the same direction. And so they won't radiate coherently. And so this coherent radio emission comes out like a beam. And the incoherent emission, which is the optical, the x-ray, and the camera and stuff, we don't need to worry about any of this coherence. It's just one electron emits one photon. And that happens at higher at higher uh, altitudes, and single photons emit uh, single electrons emit single photons, 
and there is a situation where even the downward going, the downward going uh, portion of the current can also radiate photons that can be seen out here. And so you actually end up with very, very wide emission beams in the incoherent phase and narrow cones of emission in the coherent phase. All right, that was our speedy 15 minutes reminder of emission. Now, Last week I showed a, uh, I think it was last week I showed what I called it was the most important diagram ever, which was the PP dot diagram. And you were all a little bit underwhelmed, but that's okay. Uh, this is probably, uh, this is another and very important plot to see, and probably if I had structured the lecture differently, I could have just talked about the crab all by itself for a whole lecture. So this is just, uh, a view of the emission from the crab. Now, if you people who remember, I, I told you that the crab pulsar is a known rule breaker. So the behavior that you see in the crab is not necessarily the same behavior that you see in other pulsars. But one thing that's very special about the crab is that it, it, it can be seen all the way from low low frequency radio all the way up to gamma rays. And next week is going to be called the gamma ray pulsar revolution. Uh, and actually, gamma rays is what I work on. It's the only lecture you're going to get about research that I actually do. And that extends this diagram all the way down this way. But one thing we can see about the crab, we just look at it, we can see it has two pulses. This is called the P1, or the main pulse. And this is called P2, or the interpulse. And we see that all the way from uh, 332 megahertz all the way down to 8.5 gigahertz, we see uh, these two pulses. Although you, you notice, for for whatever reason, for special properties of the crab, at, at 2.6 gigahertz, there doesn't seem to be an interpulse. And then at 4.7 gigahertz, the interpulse comes back. It comes back at, at a slightly different phase and the lower frequency radiation. And there's also the appearance of these things called high frequency component one and high frequency component two, and I'm not going to talk about them at all. And then, uh, after you move out of the radio band, you move into the, in the infrared, and you see the infrared pulse, and then the interpulse, and you'll notice again that it's not so evident on this scale, but actually there is a mission here in the middle, this is called the bridge, and so the pulse actually rises, falls, but it doesn't go to zero, rises and falls again. And this is its wide emission beams coming from the incoherent radiation, you see you see not just like pencil light beams, but you see large tails to the beam. And that's an infrared, similar story at optical, ultraviolet, x-rays, and then this is this will be called soft gamma rays. And maybe I'll talk about this next week, but one thing you'll can see about the, the soft gamma rays is that the P2 peak starts to dominate over the P1 peak. So there's a lot of interesting phenomenology about full that you can just see from this plot. But this is the crab, and the crab is a known rule breaker. So you can't necessarily infer general properties. But anyway, the crab is an awesome laboratory. We saw the nebula of the crab uh, in week three, and, and the, the full star somewhere in here, and all those particles that are made in the, in the spinning magnetic field spill out and make this, uh, make this nebula. Excuse me. Yes. Is the time axis on the previous slide, is that linear? Or is that yeah, linear? that is linear. It's a linear. Okay. This, oh, I should have said that this is a phase, and this runs from 0 to 33 milliseconds, which is the period of um, the crack pulse. Thank you. Okay. Right. Now that everybody is on the same page, and I, I've gone very fast, 10 minutes, so now I can slow down and introduce you to the bizarre world of giant radio pulses. Um, so, so um, the, uh, everybody, I kind of reorganized the slides, and I had some of this stuff before this, and then I took it away. So what I'm going to show you is the same thing you've seen many times, which is that the black sort of effect that uh, video of uh, the pulses going by. And so what we're going to see now is a crab pulsar. This is a period of 33 milliseconds, so 29 hertz. 
So you should expect to see the pulses just zipping up and down like a helicopter, kind of like Phalo was. So, as you can see, there doesn't seem to be anything, and then suddenly, like a flip. So it's a little bit undervalued, but just hold on to the end. No, no, it is, it is interesting. Now, this, this is that, that's, that's a nice uh, remark. Um, no, I, so all of these, this guy, this guy, this guy, this guy, and this guy, these are all giant. Okay, um, so people who have been looking at my slides now for six weeks probably notice that my slides are all on this background, but uh, that's that's another uh, that's a giant post from the crowd, and that's people texting me, and uh, and other giant. So this is that's giant pulse, those are giant pulses, and the regular pulse is buried in the noise. And the crowd pulse are. Can see the individual pulses unless they're giant. That's only in the crab pulsar. In other pulsars, you can actually see the regular pulses one at a time. But in the crab pulsar, you can't see the regular ones. You can only see the giant ones. So I've said some weird stuff, so I'm going to try. But hopefully, I'm going to fill, fill in fill in what all that means. The so regular pulses are buried in the noise, and these are giant pulses. So what are giant radio? They're seen in only 11 pulsars. I think I made this slide about a year ago. I don't think I know what it's been done since. They possess a very large excess of flux and energy relative to the average radio pulse. The energy distribution of giant pulses, uh, never mind that, follows the power law. That's a technical term. We will look at that later. They occur in the narrow phase window of the average, of the average pulse, and they're very, very short in time. So this is a different pulsar. This is this isn't the crab, which is in the crab, you can't make a pulse like this. I know, I'll explain why in a minute. But this is, so this is the energy on this axis, and this is like the frequency of occurrence of pulse, of, of, so a given a pulse with, say, 2,000 jets east, uh, jets east per microsecond, that's that energy unit. Uh, <laughs> that's a crazy one that's used in radio shopping. So at 2,000 jets east, or maybe, say, 1,000 jets east, you know, head, one of every 10 pulses is about that energy. So this is a normal, regular pulse. And so most of the time they're low energy and then they fall off very quickly. And then suddenly you start to see these very, very, very energetic ones. And these are the giant pulses. And in this pulse, are, uh, they come, you know, at, at, at say 2,000 or maybe, what, what was that, like 5,000 gas they are coming at about once a minute. And this pulsar is another set of pulsar. So this is so every minute we're getting you know hundreds and thousands of pulses, and then once in a while, just woo, the giant goes off, and then it goes back to the one again. So this is a picture of of, uh, of some giant pulses from this pulsar, 1937. And so this is just a zoom in over. This is a pulsar again that has two pulses from the two sort of poles of the of the rotation. And so they're not on the same scale. So that at, uh, let's just look at this one. This is uh, 1.4 megahertz. So this is a regular pulse. It's it's nice and wide, and it has a little second bubble there, and then it goes down, and then it goes up again. But once in a while, you'll get this giant pulse, and the giant pulse occurs super narrow, and the scales are the same. So the amplitude of this uh, regular pulse is one gas heat, and the amplitude of this is 60 thousand gas. So it's just plotted on the same scale for, so you can see them. And so one thing you'll notice is that the giant pulse occurs like right on the edge of the regular pulse in both cases. And, and that's pretty much common. It doesn't normally appear right in the middle. It normally appears either on the trace on the rising edge or the falling edge. And you can see that they appear at 1.4 gigahertz and 420 gigahertz. And then, the giant pulses look slightly different in uh, a different frequency. Okay, so, so the width of these guys can be 10 nanoseconds or less. 
and they're visible in both invisible star and in the pulses that have time pulses. They are visible in both the main and the inner pulse. And so this is how we saw this diagram already. This is how uh, giant radio pulses look at in this pulsar 1937. And in the crab, this is how they look. And so this sort of this is called a power law, by the way. If you plot the log of something against the log of something else, and it makes a straight line, then it's a power law. And we see that that in physics all the time. But this, so this, the giant radio pulses follow a power law in the crab and a power law in this pulsar, while the regular ones follow like a different distribution, like a galaxy or a log normal distribution. So why is it? Maybe someone knows. Why does anyone can anyone has a guess? Why we can see the normal feeble pulses individually? We can we can average them up and see them in an average sense, but to see them individually, can anyone hazard a guess why we can't see them individually in the craft? It's rotating too fast. Alright, that's a good answer. It's not the right one. <laughs> Alright, thank you. Okay, so we don't see the individual regular pulses from the craft, only the individual giant pulses. We can see the regular pulses if we average them up over many rotations. But if you want to see a single pulse in the crab, if it's a regular one, we can't see. The reason for that is because we've got this problem with the nebula. So this is a picture of the crab nebula that you've all seen, I, you know, probably 50 times by now, in x-rays. But in radio, it looks like this. So if you have a radio telescope and you map, and you map how the nebula looks in radio, now, I'm going to show you the relative size, and then it's not exactly correct. But the X-ray nebula is embedded in the radio nebula. So that's about the size of it. And this is a super bright source. This, this radio thing is a steady, remember, the, the nebula isn't pulsed. It's a steady emission. And so we have a very, very bright, glowing radio source with then this other radio source sending that little pulse of that. And so because of the background of the nebula, we can't see the individual pulses. We can only see the, the giant ones because they're so they're so bright that they can be spotted over the background of the radio nebula. All right. So I, I it took me a day. But really, it took me a day to produce the next couple of slides because um, I inserted some video in here that I stole from YouTube and it corrupted my file and <laughs> deleted everything. So, so I really worked hard on what I'm going to show you now. So I would say that what I'm about to show you now is, is one of the completely bizarre things for me as a physicist trying, and I work on giant pulses, I should say, I, I have written papers on this. This just baffles me. Okay, so this is a crab again, and this is now integrated up. So you see the main pulse and the inner pulse. And this is at 1.4 gigahertz. And, and it's been plotted over two, uh, over two periods. Now, if you have a very, very high uh, sampling telescope, so a big telescope that can record the radio emission at very, very high rate, like in nanoseconds or two nanoseconds, and you look at these giant radio pulses individually, if you look at the ones that occur in the main pulse, they look like this. Come on. All right. So let's spend a little bit of time looking at this plot. So this is a zoom in on the main pulse during one of these giant radio pulses. So the time here is in microseconds. So, and, and we're seeing that we're looking at it over a large frequency range here. So this is from about 8 gigahertz to 10 gigahertz. And so you can, and then this is like the integral of all of that. So if you just sum all of this up and just look at it. So let's just look at this top one for a second. What you can see is that the giant, the giant pulse isn't the giant pulse. In the, in the main pulse, it's not a giant pulse. It's a succession of giant pulses. And like I said, some of these are, are less than a nanosecond in width. So you'll see that a single giant pulse event actually consists of maybe a dozen uh, smaller pulses. But these, those are the smaller, these, those are the narrow pulses, are spread out in frequency. So if you look at 9 gigahertz, you see, you know, the issue, and if you look at 10 gigahertz, you see exactly the same thing. So this is uh, short in time, but broad in frequency. 
now. <laughs> if you're misfortunate enough to look at the intervals, what you see is this. So it's the same thing, it's zoomed in how it, oh, over a time. Uh, and you see that now, instead of a succession of tiny pulses, we have one pulse that lasts about five or six nanoseconds. However, it appears and disappears in different frequency bands. So if you look at it at 8.5 gigahertz, you'll see this. But if you look at it at whatever, 8.7 or something, you'll be in this little gap in between. And they're even, this is like evenly spaced in frequency. I mean, the, this sort of blob of emission, you sh then there's a valley, and then a little blob of emission, and then a valley. And so the giant radio pulses in the crowd at, at, at 9 gigahertz, in the main pulse, and in the intervals look completely different, as different as they could look. <laughs> and so the thing that took me a, a whole day to, to show you is, is that when I think about this, I think about the following. <laughs> Let's say that again. And when I think about this, it looks like this. Are you shocked? I am shocked. <laughs> I just can't believe that they do that. And, and so, yeah, people have asked me in the past, like, what is it that's the unsolved problem? And sometimes, especially when I was talking about all the stellar evolution and how we know what happened, it seemed like this was an all solved problem and it's written in books 50 years ago. People have no idea, literally no idea, how to reproduce this. Just they just don't know. So weirdos, weirdos two, weirdos one, weirdos two is all about the weird phenomenon we see in pulsars that we have a pretty difficult time explaining. And I would say that this is probably on the top of the list of pretty bizarre ideas. Right Meridian is crazy ideas. I, I I can't even read the papers because they're it, it, so when I'm grading, when I'm grading physics exams, and you find a student that doesn't know what he's talking about, but he's trying to fill a page, you'll find they use all this flowery language just to fill like ten sentences of descriptions. The, the papers read like that. Like they're just full of every conceivable weird notion glued onto another weird notion in order to, to make this happen. And what is the published on this topic? I I on the gamma ray, the gamma ray side. So weird. Like maybe when these mad giant pulses go off, all this stuff happens, like the gamma ray pulsar goes bananas or something like that. And so I worked on multi wavelength analysis of these, but the radio side of it I haven't worked on. So, uh, so you said short time drawing frequency, and then on this side is broad in time and short in frequency. And frequency showing up in frequency bands, yeah. Isn't that kind of like a kind of a natural like Fourier transform, basically? Yeah, you know what you're describing. Not, no, it's not. It just isn't. <laughs> uh, anyway, let, we've marvelled at this for long enough. Although I could yeah, think about this all day. Uh, so let's move on anyway, um, uh, and say we're trying to pull this for a little bit longer. So, so one thing I made a big look hoo ha about uh, on, on on the first time we saw this emission business. Was I was talking about how the radio emission is coherent, the radio emission is coherent, but the, uh, the higher energy emission, the gamma rays, the optical, and the x rays are all incoherent. And I told you a few, a few uh, reasons for that. The main reason is that the radio emission from pulsars is by itself so bright that we couldn't see the radio photon from an individual uh, electron. The only way to, to see anything that bright is to get them all to work collectively to produce these bright pulses. However, the, uh, optic, the incoherent emission, uh, we don't need that to worry about that. We can see an individual uh, X-ray photon or gamma-ray photon. And then there's also the fact that the beam profiles look completely different. The radio profiles look pretty much like a beam, although we're going to destroy that in you know, 10 minutes. Uh, they look pretty much like a beam, whereas uh, the X-ray and optical stuff looks like sort of weird double peaks with a bridge in between and that kind of business. One other thing I told you uh, to remind you all is that we're pretty sure that the uh, incoherent radiation has to be created at higher altitudes. And that's because
because we don't think it can escape the polar region because like this figure demonstrates, when you make a photon in this region, it, it, bumps into the, it bumps into the magnetic field and makes a pair. So only low, and so you need to have a certain amount of energy in your original photon in order to make the energy necessary to make a pair. So the lower energy photons, the lower energy photons can escape because they don't have enough energy to make a pair. As soon as your combined energy and the magnetic field energy have enough energy to make a pair, and you make a pair, and you never you get absorbed. So the higher energy stuff, the higher energy photon sort of has to happen at higher higher distances from the star because at higher distances from the star, the magnetic field is weaker. All right. So in 2003, a very startling result uh, was published, and it's been recently. Uh, uh, second group have published the same result, so it's it's pretty solid. <laughs> For about 10 years, I would say, people were kind of, is this really true? But it seems to be true. So remember this picture now of uh, the crab and all its different uh, and all its different emission profiles. And this is, in, this is a coherent emission in radio. And the incoherent emission of an eye, uh, of an higher energy is infrared optical so UV X-ray camera. Rate. Well, let me just go back. So, what, what the next plot is what the next plot is showing you is basically showing you a zoom in of this peak and say this peak. So if you took this peak here and this peak here and zoomed in, you'd see the following. So that uh, that sort of like exploded view of it is it's, it's up in the corner of the zoom in. So this is where the radio peak happens. And this is where the optical peak happens. So the optical peak happens, you know, half a percent or so or earlier. And what's plotted here is the red is the average optical pulse. If you take the 40 pulses before a giant pulse and the 40 pulses after a giant pulse and average it. So you will, so 40 pulses, so this pulse is 30 times a second. So this is like, if you average a second's worth of data before a giant pulse, and average a second worth of data after a giant pulse, you get this red line. However, if you average the one event, the one optical pulse that happens simultaneously with the giant pulse, and you average them, you get the black line. So what this is telling you is that the average optical pulse during a giant radio pulse is 10 times brighter than, sorry, not 10 times, 10%. 10% prior than the 40 pulses before and after. So this, this is pretty startling. This might seem startling, but it's just startling because it means the following. It means that the coherent emission and the incoherent emission are linked somehow. They're talking to each other. Somehow they're talking to each other. Whatever it is that makes the giant radio pulse also does something at the exact same time to tell the optical pulse, you also have to be a little bit brighter than your neighbors. And yeah, people don't really know how this happens. Like, this isn't, this isn't the, what's my next slide? Where are we? Oh, I'm doing it. Nice, okay. All right. So, what we're going to talk about later, and what I said before, is that I remember when the first week when I showed you this picture, and then I showed you some some uh, wave uh, waveforms of the pulsar, and they were going by, and they were fluctuating up and down. And I said, that's because of the coherence. You know, sometimes it's more coherent, and sometimes it's less coherent, and so sometimes you get a slightly brighter pulse, and sometimes you get a slightly dimmer pulse. However, the coherence, whatever would make these particles at the radio, whatever would make these particles here sort of glue together a bit closer or hang out in tighter bunches in order to make a more coherent pulse that's super bright. That shouldn't really be talking to these guys out here. So an, an idea that the giant radio pulses somehow get amplified coherence and that's why they're super bright. That doesn't really explain why then the optical pulse would also be brighter. So then in this, in this cartoon as well about how there's this pair creation. So this is called pair creation, where you turn a uh, photon into a pair. 
And so people have argued, well, maybe something happens to the pair creation that you're somehow making a bunch more pairs. Suddenly, in a very short space of time, you make a bunch more pairs. And so if you have more particles here, then maybe you can get a boost in the coherence, or a boost in the emission. And then these particles also, you know, very quickly move to higher, higher altitudes and then radiate incoherently. And so the, this optical correlation with the giant radio pulse argues that something is pushing the pair creation rate higher. But again, this is that it would be created, that it would happen so quickly that you would just turn on, like for less than one rotation, you would turn on like a little enhancement in the pair creation rate. People don't know why this happens. But this happens. So this again is this again is another confounding problem of the magnetic sphere. How do you get the coherent emission and the incoherent emission to talk to each other? And what we have just shown is that they somehow must be talking to each other, but we don't exactly know how. So the best argument, but it's complete, it's not even an argument, it's just a scratching your head kind of thought. It must be to do with the pair creation or something like that. Other things you can think about. Other things you can think about is maybe the beam moves a bit. For whatever reason, the beam sort of moves a bit. And so the beam we actually happen to be seeing is, is a regular beam, and there happens to be like a super energetic beam right beside it. And then the beam, for whatever reason, the beam just moves a bit, and so we just get a blast of a very bright one, when ordinarily we don't. And that, that sort of little wiggle to the side also makes the optical pushes. The same thing is happening higher up, and the optical is going out and some large scale kind of change in the magnetic sphere direction could then also mean that the optical comes out a little bit uh, enhanced too. So that's another argument that rather than it being a mechanism turning turning up the emission, that it's a geometrical kind of change in direction for like a very small period of time. So those are plausible concepts, but people have no idea. Okay. Giant, that was your radio pulse. And now uh, the awful truth about radio emission. <laughs> um, well, you, you should already feel like that something is wrong. Something is wrong with, with Andrew's nice cartoon ideas. It's much more complicated than it. It certainly is more complicated. So, so this is a this is a echo of week one. We all saw this this slide on week one, and I said, "Behold, pulsars! Look at how." awesome and regular and nicely behaved, although they do fluctuate up and down, and I said that was because of coherence changes, and everyone believed me. <laughs> and, and, and maybe it is, maybe it is, but it, let's look at this plot in a, in a slightly different way. Rather than looking at it going across, let's look at it going up. So we're zooming in on the pulse. And now you're seeing the terrible nastiness that each one of those pulses is. It's <laughs> so it's over here is the average profile zoomed in. So on average, it looks like a little peak, and then maybe a shoulder, and then another peak, and then a little bit up here, and then another peak. So I would say I can resolve one, two, three, four, five structures that seem to be present in general, although each individual pulse seems to be behaving however it wants, but on average it just adds up to this stable profile. Yeah, not so nice. So again, you all saw this pulsar on week one. And now it's so this has got this has got a main pulse and an interpulse, although the interpulse seem to disappear for large periods of time and then it comes back again. The main pulse has uh, one, two, three, four general features that show up. The other pulse is maybe three. But a single pulse doesn't seem to know anything particular about the shape. It just seems to do what it wants. And this is just the way it is. This pulsars are dirty looking pulses. If you look at the individual pulses, they don't look nice and clean. The average though, if you average a hundred of them together, that looks amazingly stable. So 
You take a hundred of them, you average, you make the profile. You take another hundred of them, you average, you make the exact same profile. They look almost exactly the same. So they, over, over an integration period of 100 or 200 pulses, the average shape looks incredibly stable. But the individual pulses are, are completely yeah, odd and ugly and haggard and weird. <laughs> So, so this is like, so I, I drew this cartoon and I said, oh yeah, it comes out like a lighthouse beam and I didn't put any structure in it. So people, and this is just motivated by, this isn't really motivated by physics, like the, that, that instead of it having like a, a, a single kind of emission cone, that the cone has like a sort of a, a, a structure to it that like it sort of has a bright spot in the middle of the cone and then like a ring of not so bright and then a bright bit again. This is completely geometrically, <coughs> this is geometrically generated in order that if you would take a slice, you would take different observer slices so you can imagine if the beam is coming, cutting across our line of sight, if you move the beam slightly over, slightly down, you're going to cut a different slice across it. And so if you have a shape like this, if you cut across it almost along the middle, you're going to see three pulses, if you put across it at the edge, you're going to see two, and if you put across it right at the edge, you're only going to see one. And so people said, oh, okay, well, if we, if we somehow argue that the emission beam has this sort of weird structure, then we can get some weird stuff out of them, uh, weird individual pulses out. But yet, yeah, this is, this isn't, this, there's no physics here, I don't, I don't feel like there's any physics here. I can't access it if it's there. It seems like seems like yeah, the data is confounding and people don't know and so they're just sort of throwing it, anything they can think of in to try and solve the problem. So this is a, <laughs> this is a close-up of the, the terror. So you all have this in your hand out. So this shows a train of, of, of um, pulses from this pulsar B0826-34. And this has a main pulse and an interpulse. And the, the, as you've seen now, that each individual pulse looks like a complete mess. But the, the profile is pretty stable. But what you can see here is that for some reason, and this happens, the pulse that pulse are through this, it just turns off. So it's like kind of the opposite of a giant pulse. It's like going along. It's going along okay, but it's bubbling away. And then suddenly it just stops. And then it switches back on straight away. And then switches back off again, and then switches on. And so you know these switches between the on and the off happen in one rotation. It's not like we see it sort of wane and then stay off. It just it's off, and then it's back on. And yeah, this is called this is called nulling, and uh, we don't know why they do it, but they they do it. It's confirmed from separate. Oh yeah, oh it's a full set null. This is. This is the standard lore of pulsars. This isn't the, uh, I mean, it's totally weird, but it's not that uh, unique. Uh, now, if you look, if you look at this, this is the same pulsar here, but then now rather than looking at it in this view, I have it in a slightly different view. So the sort of the density of the gray scale here, like if it's super black, then it's a peak, and if it's gray or white, then there's no peak. And so you can see the nulls, there's a null. There's a null. There's a null. But if you, if you can see the behavior of the interpulse, look at it. It seems to be waving. I mean, you, you may even can see some sort of drifting. Like, like whatever, whatever weird little blippy feature in the pulse that happens around here, it wanders. Yet, when you average it up, you know, when you average it all this up, you get this shape. And this shape, like as I said, it's pretty stable. Over many rotations, if you average it up, it seems like this. But if you look at the individual behavior, so this isn't quite a phenomenon. Well, maybe it is. We, let's call this drifting subpulses. People call this drifting subpulses. And that is a scene that some features seem pretty stable, maybe, and other features seem to wiggle around. This is a. This is another. This is another pulsar. This, the drifting subpulses in this are much more obvious. You see that they kind of wag over that way, and then they come back, 
and then they wag over, and then they come back. So you can kind of see that that uh, the pulse, the whole pulse itself, or the main components of the pulse, are actually drifting across, and then a big mega goal, <laughs> and then the pulse is starting again, and then another null. So this is this is, this pulse are exhibits very clear nulling and drifting so pulses. And we think that the nulling, whatever the nulling is, and whatever the drifting subpulses are, we think that they're maybe related. Okay, so this is another, so this is, this is 1944, the other one was 08 something something. This is 0809 and a different guy. So you, you can see here again, you get very obvious drifting subpulses moving across that mega null, and then more of it. Now, if you take this, horrible nastiness and you kind of smooth it out, then you can make this plot. And what, one thing that the lines are, that are drawn here is that the drift rates are different. Here it's drifting with this velocity across the, across, then there's a null, and then the drift rate is different. But then as it proceeds, the drift rate changes again. So that it's like the null almost resets the drift. It's like it's, it's drifting, and then the null happens, and then the drift rate slows down, and then it builds back up again. And so this isn't this isn't unique to this pulsar. This this seen in other pulsars that that the drifting and the nulling are maybe somehow related. But again, we don't know why. I, I'm going to show you some wacky cartoons in a minute. Uh, this is another. This is people argue that this is periodic nulls. So what we're showing you here, rather than showing this, this sort of wave train, is just if you integrate up the pulse energy. And so you plot the pulse energy against pulse number. So you can see that it's like on for a while and then off, and null, on again, off, and then another null. And so it seems like semi-regular nulling. But again, this I think is a, I don't know if I, I don't know if I quite believe that this is periodic nulling, but quasi periodic nulling, maybe. And and yeah, again, people don't know why this happens, but it, but they have come up with crazy ideas. And this this I'm gonna show you, I'm gonna when I saw this as a young grad student, I saw somebody give a talk. <laughs> Some viewers give a talk and he put this picture up and I just like was like, no, you can't be serious. You can't be serious. This this is not it's very scientific. But anyway, I, I think it's a fact, and I think people don't talk about this anymore, but they were talking about it 10 years ago. So the picture of the emission beam that I had drawn, where you have the sort of cone that's spinning around, yeah. well, in order, to, in order to accommodate this kind of weird behavior, they decided, well, maybe it isn't a cone. Maybe it's a cone of cones. <laughs> and so this is our cone coming out, and then you have sub-cones, and these cones actually move with their, so, so the whole thing is moving around, but then this cone is moving around like a carousel. They call this a carousel. And so this black line is sort of showing our line of sight. And so depending on the rotation of the carousel and how the carousel rotates with relation to how, then maybe we're seeing slightly different, you know. And, and this is only one, this is only one, stage of it, they have like a secondary carousel. So in order to explain other stuff, sometimes there's a second carousel in there that moves around. Maybe it moves around in a different speed or in a different direction. It's like epic cycles, exactly. It's just, it's just, it's just, it doesn't make any sense to me at all. But, but the fact that physicists are going down this kind of crazy route to explain the sort of weirdness of the nulling and the weirdness of the drifting so pulses should sort of indicate to you that the radio emission, particularly the radio emission, has very bizarre phenomena, and we don't know why it happens. Uh, and one thing I said, that I maybe said it in the early weeks, I don't know if I said it in the lecture, or if I said it in the question period, but I said the following thing, I said, trying to understand the magnetosphere of a pulsar by looking at the radio emission, is like trying to understand the internal combustion engine by looking at the drifts 
from the exhaust pipe at the back of the car. <laughs> because radio photons have no energy. They are super low energy. Like Joshua Bell gave a talk. She gave a talk at Miguel a few years ago. I was going to do this when I am. I'm just also be prepared as she was. And, and we all came in, and everyone was happy to see Joshua Bell. She's the scorer of full yada, yada, yada. And uh, she, in the middle of the talk, she says, everybody, I want you to look under your seat. And so we all look under her seat, and we find there's a white envelope under the chair. So everybody, you know, quickly pulls out their white envelope, and they open the envelope, and they take out a tiny slip of paper. And the slip of paper says, the amount of energy you use to open this envelope is more than the energy we have detected from all pulsars ever. <laughs> like, we need huge, huge dishes and huge, huge amplifiers to measure these tiny, tiny little photons. They're, well, they're not tiny, tiny energy. The energy in them is tiny. So the magnetosphere is a very, very energetic wild beast. And this radio stuff that it's piddling off on the side is just, you know, rolling, but it's just nothing. It, it, it's tiny, tiny amount of energy. So the fact that, that it sort of exhibits the winds of the magnetosphere, that subtle change in the magnetosphere would cause change in the radio beam, that isn't that, isn't that shocking. But, but yeah, it's very, very difficult to understand how the magnetosphere behaves by looking at the radio. Because the radio just has no energy. All right, I'm feeling good. All right, that was Nolan. So one thing I one thing I should say. So this is a, the famous PP dot diagram. Uh, period on the x-axis, the period slow down on the y-axis. Slow spinning but fast spin down over here. Fast spinning but slow spin down over here. And the bull radio population. And this one line I didn't describe last week is this blue line here. And this is they call they call on, on this side of the line they call it the graveyard. <laughs> this is the graveyard. And so we believe we believe that if you have a combination of spin and spin period in this range, like if you're slow spinning and and have a very slow spin down, that you can sustain the magnetosphere, that you can sustain the radiation. And so it, it, after a period it sort of wanders through its life, so age as you can uh, contour. So per pulsars sort of age this way, and as they cross this, they call it the death line. After they cross the death line, they go into the graveyard. And so we believe that pulse, we believe that this, the fact that we don't see a population of pulsars over here is because these neutron stars have wandered over here, and they're still spinning, they're still doing their stuff, but they just can't, uh, can't make the magnetosphere, so they can't make the radiation. And uh, no like. So yeah, blowing is very fast and switches on and off on rotation. It's most common in older slow spinning pulsars close to the deadline. And there, so both things seem to be related to knowing, and it's also commonly seen in slow spinning pulsars. So maybe what we're seeing with the nulling and with the drifting sub pulses is sort of failures of the magnetosphere to be regular. Failures because the magnetosphere mechanism is maybe petering out. And so what, what happens, it's not clear, but what we think happens is just the nulls get longer, and the magnetospheres stop happening, and eventually they just are forever nulled, and they are over here. So that's how that's how the that's how the nulling and the drifting subpulses fits into the fits into the big, big grand picture. The giant pulses, however, there's only eleven of them, and we, and they are down here, they're up here, they're everywhere. The, so the eleven the eleven pulsars that we know to make giant pulses don't seem to live preferentially anywhere here. It's not related to the spin, it's not related to the spin now. So yeah, the giant pulse mechanism is another bizarre mechanism that we don't know about. Okay, and finally, mode switching. This is a paper where I'm going to show you now. Actually, I think it's really great the way things are going now because I'm actually showing you scientific papers. Like, I'm, I don't know, maybe people are bored or are not as enjoying the lectures as they were because in the old days I had to make a lot of cartoons to sort of kind of illustrate stuff. And now, pretty much this whole lecture you have been seeing 
academic journal. So you're, you're seeing the plots that we look at as physicists, not, not idealizations of them. So, you know, if you're following this, then you're really up to speed. <laughs> um, so this is a paper, and this, like I said, it's really hard, and this came out two years ago. This, again, uh, this was in, in Science Magazine, and what a, it's a completely bizarre thing, and uh, yeah, it's awesome. Mode switching. Well, mode switching was known about, but now we know something else about mode switching. All right. So here we are looking at, at, at the, I should say, I should have taken one of these guys and just plopped it on top here. So what you're seeing is like the pulse, but you're seeing it against time. So this is a six-hour observation. And the pulse happens at this phase, say phase a half or so. And so you see, it seems to be switched off. Not quite an old. It's still there. But then it switches on, and then it's on. This here is some instrumental failure. This is not the pulse right. This is that they switched off the telescope or switched on the microwave or something like that. And then it's, here's a very, very clear period of the mode switching. So it goes from being what they call the bright mode to the quiet mode. That's what they have a cube. And the bright mode again. So in the space of what we would say that is half hour, in about 20 minutes, about 20 minutes, this pulsar switches from its bright mode to its quiescent mode, and then bright again. And so this is a this is a picture of how it looks uh, between those two modes. So this is the bright mode here. You can see those of you who are who are uh, very close might see that there's a little shoulder here. So it's not it's not quite a single pulse. It's maybe a pulse with a little baby shoulder. And then, in the, and then in the quiet time, it looks like this. All right, so, so this is how the bright mode looks, and this is how the quiet mode looks. Now, these guys, very clever guy, uh, Bim Hermsen uh, in uh, the Netherlands, who's an old 70-year-old guy who shouldn't be doing research anymore, but he, he, uh, he, this was his idea, and normally the 70-year-old guys don't put their names in the front of the paper because they like their younger colleagues to sort of get, but he was trying to do this for 10 years, and, uh, and the reason he couldn't do it is because uh, we needed an X-ray telescope, and in order to get time on an X-ray telescope or a space telescope, like the whole telescope, you have to write a proposal, and then a bunch of people read the proposal and decide whether it's a good idea. And this idea was so crazy that for 10 years, even though he's a big prestigious guy, they're like, this is so crazy, we're never going to do it. And after 10 years of passing them, they finally did it. And then they discovered something to three feet bananas. <laughs> All right. So what you have seen so far is that the, X, the radio behavior of this pulsar switches modes. It goes from being bright to being quiet, but not low, and then bright again. And then if you can persuade your X-ray Space telescope colleagues that point for many hours at this pulsar, then you're going to see this. <laughs> so what you can see here is that during the bright radio mode, there is no X-ray pulsar. There is an X-ray source. You see, there is ten counts. So, so it is there is an X-ray source there, but it doesn't seem like it's a pulsar. But when the radio switches down a notch, when you, when you turn it down to the quiescent mode then suddenly an X-ray pulsar turns them off. And so the other one is what, radio? Yeah, so this is, the, the lower panel here is radio uh, at 140 megahertz, and the top panel here is, is, is X-ray at a half a kg to two k. So this is pretty, this is pretty nuts. I don't know how you explain this, but I'm going to try, I'm going to at least talk a little bit about an X-ray pulsar for a second, this kind of X-ray pulsar, which is not, this is thermal, not non-thermal. So before I told you all about thermal emission, this is, sorry, non-thermal emission from pulsars, this is thermal X-ray. So how do you get thermal X-rays out of a pulsar? So remember this picture now you're all familiar with. Well, what you can already see from this is that these downward going particles, they're gaining energy to being accelerated, they're smacking into the pole. So we, we have a beam of particles that are coming down and raining down on the top of on the, the top of the pulsar. And also they're emitting radiation and that radiation is also going down on the cap. And so in some configurations you can actually heat the cap of the neutron star by this mechanism. So you end up with the 
hot flux on the, on the poles and then the hot flux and then the x-rays. And these x-rays are not going to be in a beam because it's like an isotopic that, that it's like a it's, it's a hot surface that just is, is heat's coming off. So the heat doesn't have to come off in like a laser beam, it just is coming off in any direction. And so the, the x-rays that come from a hot surface like this won't have a beam. And that's why this doesn't look like a beam. That's why it doesn't have like a you know, beam structure. It looks almost like a sinusoid. And so if, if you can imagine, just imagine a sphere that had like sort of a hot patch and that hot patch was like spinning around, then that's, this is the kind of shape you would imagine. And also we can see it in the spectrum. Like if you look at the x-ray spectrum, I don't have a figure of it, but you can tell whether an x-ray spectrum looks like a, a black body, whether it looks like a thermal spectrum, or whether it looks like a non-thermal spectrum. And so the spectrum of this pulsing component and the shape of the pulsing component tells you that it's, uh, that it's uh, thermal. And so something has to be happening Something has to be happening that, so we are, we believe in the, in the sort of framework that I've tried to describe, we believe that the radio is coming out of here, and then something happens that changes the radio beam a bit, but diverts current down onto the, onto the cap. Because, because we should see this hot thermal neutron star all the time. Like, if it was always hot, we would see it all the time. Like if the radio, if the radio emission wasn't actually, if the thing that drives the radio emission wasn't sort of turning on the heat and then turning it off again, then then we would see a radio, sorry, we would see an X-ray pulsar in this period here. But the X-ray pulsar really turns on, and then it really turns off. So it is like it is like something is turning on the oven or turning on the stove top on the top of the neutron star. That thing that turns that oven on also switches off the, the radio or somehow suppresses the radio so it goes into the quiet state. And then something happens that turns off the stove top and tells the radio that you can go back to being the right radio again. So this was discovered at only two years ago. And since then they found another another example of this. So that is after after they published this paper then it was much easier to convince the X-ray telescopes to, you know, to investigate others. And so they investigated other modes switching pulsars and they saw the same thing. That when the radio pulsar switched from the bright mode to the quiet mode, an X-ray pulsar suddenly turned on and then turned off. <laughs> but the explanation for this is, is not there. Alright, so that's weird. There you go, it's weird. And so, uh, they don't have to be. They're not, 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 and that's why it varies on the because it's actually. Yeah, yeah. Right. So, so yeah, we're, 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 I'm done. I'm done. You, you, I had all the weirdos. So, thank you very much. Oh, I just wanted to go back. 
Oh, you just want to see it there. But, but there's no, we don't know that. And 
the, the, the cartoon I'm drawing you about like a beam coming out this way, there are some alternate cartoons out there that have beams going kind of like out this way. Like, I mean, I've drawn the beam going out that way for the incoherent emission, for the optical and the yeah, X-ray. Right. But there are people that have postulated that the, the radio is also coming out not like in a lighthouse, but like a you know a lighthouse with an attachment. <laughs> That not oh, really? Yeah. Oh, wow. Um, but yeah. But again, people are so uh, stumped by the phenomenology that none of these simple geometrical uh, arrangements are going to are going to match the observed observations. What I was wondering was, is the strength of the magnetic field so strong that the only emissions that we see are in the weaker area, in and around the pole? That's certainly the case for the gamma rays. The gamma, the, the, stuff, the gamma rays have to be coming from outside, away from the pulse, because they would never escape otherwise. Gamma rays have a lot of energy, and so even in, even in a weak magnetic field, they would make a pair and not escape to be viewed. So the gamma rays would be created, but they would not escape. And so if you want to make gamma rays and have them observe, observe you have to put them <laughs> further and further out. But the radio emission, and the lower energy emission is so uh, feeble in energy that it can still move through a magnetic field and not make a pair, therefore still escape. That's Thank you. Yes, sir. Look, why did they have an electric field? Why did they have, so the electric field is generated by the rotating magnetic field. This is like uh, from week three or four. So I showed the, the diagram of, the, of Andre uh, Tim Olkin with a drill <coughs> and a magnetic uh, bit on the end. Yeah. Did you see that? Um, okay, so yeah, a spinning, a spinning uh, magnet will make, a magnet, will make an electric field. No, no. But but I don't think it, because it's, it's a minefield. Like, right? People don't know, and I also don't know. But, but the, electri the electric current that makes a magnetic field is left over from, from the collapse. So, um, referring to this uh, fact that you uh, described, where if you take a hundred pulses and average them, and average them you, you get in the, on the individuals you get some variation, but in the average it produces a very uniform pattern. Yes. So that you can repeat that over and over again. Uh, two questions. On the individual variations, then, does that mean your clock is an erratic clock? And secondly, um, for the average being so regular, it seems like that is the law that you are observing, and it doesn't seem to be a specific law that prohibits these irregularities. Is there any kind of a yeah, function, okay. a okay. function that would you you know you you well, you're very perceptive and you're absolutely right. So you're, you're, you're. So the question was uh, about in week four I talked about how we have amazing clocks in space with precision time and then we can measure Einstein and everyone's happy. So you have to use the average in order to do that. What's precise is the average. That doesn't bother. We've never seen it bother. It's very, very precise. Some pulsars that have have what's called timing noise, and this is this is you know these are not good pulsars for timing. These are not good pulsars for gravitational wave stuff. But uh, but yeah. So uh, well, well, this is going to be kind of mathematical, but basically there's an underlying mathematical. Uh, uh, frequency of stuff that's complex. So, like, let, let's just imagine we have. Let, let's say, uh, let's turn on the, Let's go to the blackboard. I love the blackboard. Uh, sometimes I think I should just talk in front of the blackboard and not uh, do PowerPoint. There's a, a movement to, to do that. Okay, I don't know if this is going to be any good. Here we go. So, so we're saying our regular pulsar shape, our average pulsar shape, for simplicity, let's say it's a top half. Okay? For simplicity, this is what our average shape looks like. And so it has 
three components. It has this guy, and then it has this guy. Well, no, no, shouldn't say that. It has three components that are exactly the same. But this guy happens every time. This guy happens two thirds of the time, and this guy happens one third of the time. Okay? And so, what is regular is whatever piece of the whatever piece of the pulsar makes this little pulse, he likes to go at two thirds the rate of this guy. And this guy likes to go at one third of the rate of this guy. And that is very major. So the, the sort of uh, participation distribution of the subpulses is very major. So a given one that you look at, a given instance can seem like it doesn't obey any, uh, any um, sort of distribution behavior. But when you average it up and you see that on average they all turn out the same, the underlying idea is that the, this, the, part, this, the participation of these parts of the pulses uh, behaves in an in a kind of average sense in, in the same way. So a given instance, a given instance doesn't have to look like this, but over time that creates that. And so, yeah, those of you, so there is a sort of a, and that's the physics right there. The physics is why would that guy happen two thirds of the time to that guy, and why would this guy happen one third of the time to that guy? And so there are some magnetospheric processes in there that produce that. And is this still mysterious or is it totally mysterious? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not the only one. Not a problem. But that's a great question. And so the timing, Joe Taylor and all these people who time the pulses and win Nobel Prizes and whatnot, their clocks are only stable over over many rotations, not over one. Uh, in this model here, is the interval between each of the pulses that occur only one third of the time? Are those regular, or are they kind of random? One more time. One more time. All right. You have uh, the, the one that occurs one third the uh, rate of the, the middle one. Yeah. Does it occur regularly at the same period each time? Or some pulsars it does. Like uh, some pulsars it does, but then some pulsars this guy will also. Wander. He'll, you know, there's, there's like a drift in subpulses, like it, whatever it is that's making this guy one third of the time, you know, one tenth of the, like over the course of ten rotations it will have drifted, and then something will happen and then it'll jump, like a null will happen and it'll go back to the start again. But this, it, so, so it does have sort of an epicycle feel about it, like, but, but it's, but it's, it's hard, it's really, really hard to pin it down. All of that. It's almost impossible to look at the enterprise up there and you know go sniffing around with the tracker game and whatnot. <laughs> all right, one, one or two more questions. Is there any computer model that uh, approximates this at all? So pe people do people do models of magnetospheres and in order to and trying to understand the geometry of the magnetosphere and where all the particles go and everything. We're tracking the radiation from tracking the radio radiation from that is almost an impossible task because it's so easy to make it. You know, it's so easy to bleed all the few radio photons and it will have no observable effect on the on the magnetosphere. So it's it's hard to do the particles and the radiation if you were interested in the radio radiation. The gamma rays have so much energy that they actually they have to track the gamma rays or or else you won't conserve energy in your simulation. But uh, but the radio you can leave off as many of them as you want and not even notice. But what what's kind of nuts? What I find kind of nuts about the most switching pulse are where the the, the thermal X-ray hotspot turns on. That that tells me that they're yeah that tells me that you know whatever process turns off the radio can turn on a pretty hot hob like it turns the soap hob on pretty hot in order for an X-ray pulse to get. To get going, so so maybe yeah, I, I don't know. I, I mean, this is only a year old. This uh, it's maybe two years old now. This was all about the moment switching X-ray stuff. So yeah, people are still scrambling to figure it out. But the people who wrote that paper are very, very I respect them hugely. They're not they're not the cowboys. They're very very sane. And they uh, at the end of the paper, they don't even try to offer an explanation because it's completely nuts. We know, of, we know of one 
1,000 or 2,000 uh, pulsars. Uh -huh. And they have to be properly aligned for, for us to see them. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So is it possible that there are many, many more so that we Absolutely. Just don't know about them? Certainly. Like, for instance, in the whole scalar pulsar, the, the pulsar that, that, that I showed a couple weeks ago that did all the general relativity tests, we're pretty certain that the companion of that is another pulsar because we can measure the mass of the companion, and it's exactly 1.4 solar masses. And so it's, it's absolutely possible that that is a pulsar which is being aligned in a different direction. So we don't Yes, sir? In one of your early cartoons of uh, uh, non-coherent radiation, uh, you showed the electron winding around the field line, and then suddenly you had an electron and a positron moving in the opposite direction. Where did the positron come from? So what I showed you was a photon coming out. So what I, what I the cartoon was trying to show you was an electron that's moving along. It gets bent in the magnetic field. By curving in the magnetic field, it shoots out a photon. Now we have energy, an energy packet. Photon is an energy packet. And it's moving through a big, huge bank of energy, which is the magnetic field that stores a lot of energy. And so the magnetic field and the photon collide and make a pair. So it's an E equals mc squared situation. The energy that's in the photon gets turned into the, the mass of the particles. And because you make an electron and you make a positron, they have no net charge. The, the pair have no net charge. And so beforehand, you said the same amount of energy as afterwards, beforehand you have the same amount of charge as afterwards. So this is called pair production. And this is this happens in part of physics, you know, all of that. But I'm, I'm, I'm finished now, folks, so uh, thank you for your attention and I'll see you next week.